need of museums interpretation. And I'm sure all of us is interested in changing and moving the field of museums to new perspectives. We are all looking forward to good conversations, discussions,
Ja, tak. Øh, først en praktisk bemærkning. Alle bedes sætte deres mobiltelefon på lydløs. And then to the theme of the conference, exhibitions. Why do we have exhibitions? Does the object drive the story in an exhibition? Where do the voices come from in a museum? Do we, as curators and educators, know our audience well enough? These are some of the questions we will try to answer today. And the program for today, first we will have a keynote speaker, then a roundtable discussion for 15 minutes, then questions, and then the second keynote speaker. Music means that you can close your eyes and immerse yourself for three minutes contemplation to a piece of music. After the third keynote speaker, we will head around 16 o'clock tour to Denmark. And then we will finally have a general debate with our three keynote speakers. Yes. Now to the first keynote speaker. Uh, allow me to welcome Peter Higgins, an architect who founded Land Design Studio 20 years ago. You have done exhibitions, museums, and created visitor experiences for 20 years. And you will speak about museum making and exhibition design for the last 30 years. Welcome. Thank you, Morten. Um, it's all right, I'm not going to make any phone calls. This is to time myself, okay? I'm in trouble otherwise. Um, what a great, what a great uh, conference and what a great venue. Um, you know, incredibly kind of informal. I feel like it's the Oscars and, you know, the winner is, you know. So all those at the front, you know you've won. Um, I just need to switch this, I guess. Um, yeah, as Morton said, I've got to, I mean, sadly, I do know something about the last 30 years of, of exhibition making. But um, when, when I was asked to do the, um, the talk today, um, I thought it's not that simple. To begin with, I thought that's quite easy, and then it got harder and harder because uh, it isn't simple. It's very random. It's not linear story. Um, this is a personal story, and that's the best I can do while we start my Mac. <laughs> and, um, so that's the best I can do is give you my personal view. Um, uh, it becomes a PhD thesis, actually. It's not for 30 minutes. So um, this is my kind of big picture. This is my... Macintosh, which is not talking to that screen at the moment. That's all right. It's not, Any good? It's not sending out. The not sending out. No, okay. So anyway, I'll Ooh. just ad lib. I started life as a, an architect, as Morton said, which is a great training. Um, and by default, I started to work at the BBC um, as a production designer. So I started to work in film and uh, television started to work with the script. Um, it's very interesting, a script, the written word, is very, very different from a brief um, because it has characters and you have to invent and create settings for, for characters. You work with cinematographers, uh, you work with directors. Um, and then in the theater, when I worked in the theater, you find that you're working for, um, you're working for 500 eyes, not for one eye, which is the lens uh, in television and theater. I then moved on to work for a large production company called Imagination in Covent Garden, where I started to learn about the, um, actually to learn about the commercial world and the world of uh, brands, the brandscape. Um, so, which I didn't really enjoy, but it, it, it kind of opened my eyes to understand what we now call visitor profiles. So, it made me understand the market, the brand, but in working in museums, it's much more subtle and much more, um, much more sensitive about who is the visitor, you know, the international visitor, the local visitor, the repeat visitor, the edu educational visitor. So, um, so I think that that experience before starting land um, 
25 years ago was actually quite valuable. I can only ad lib for so long, you know. This is, a, and then my mother. <laughs> but I'll carry on. I'll carry on. Why not? So when we studied land, I have a, a diagram which I'll show, which is very important, which is architecture. <laughs> Mine now. Yeah. He, we just take three minutes technical pause here. I can carry on. Yeah. I'll carry on. It's all right. I'm happy. I don't know how to oh. get your computer so to find out the picture. Um, I can, I, can I walk, can I talk and do this at the same oh. time? Have a look. Yeah. I have a screen over there. I think Did you ever see now. the Ken Robinson, uh, TED Talks, you know? One. Now it's on. Okay. Okay. And then okay? please... Uh, so I can I exit screen. this completely? Yeah. Exit completely. Set it to power to show so now. Shut down. Yeah. Shut down. It may start. It just start your PowerPoint. Yeah. This. And so I'm just shutting right down now. So yeah. this sometimes happens. Yeah. Okay. But it, I have a control monitor over there. We're, we're not over here. I can see yeah. the picture. When okay. it's over there, it's also further on. It should be up now. Now, where was I? I okay, I still have 30 minutes, Morton, is that right? Please. Um, 
the right start. Okay. The Ashmolean. Um, it's a good place to start in Oxford. It was our first public institution where they brought objects from around the world and put them in a, 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 an informal setting, in, or sorry, a very formal setting related to the University of, of Oxford. It was used really as a, as a teaching place. Um, it was a place of authority. Uh, it actually made the, uh, it made the uneducated feel inferior, I think. The galleries were classic um, country house or um, a palace, actually, with objects filling the alcoves. There, there was no real rationale. The, the objects were left to pretty much um, speak for themselves. But there was no interpretation, of course. So this is very familiar territory for, for everybody. But just to remind us, this is very interesting. I took this photograph last year at... Uh, um, at a public school, you, you know, they're private. We call them public schools, it's an anomaly, but they're private schools, Winchester. And it's interesting because um, clearly the museum is really for teaching children um, who go to lectures about the objects, which is exactly pretty much what happened at the Ashmolean. If you wanted to find out more, you went to a lecture, you didn't have labels or interpretation or any, any real um, help to understand the relationship or the context of those objects. This is very funny, I think this is wonderful. This is a, um, a motorbike museum, and my guess is that only people interested in motorbikes go to this. <laughs> and why not? It's wonderful. Um, and when, this is on the Isle of Man, the Isle of Man TT races you may know about. Um, what they've done is they printed the technical manual and stuck it down in front of these, are they carburetors? I guess they are. But I have to say, I really enjoy being there. It was, it's a wonderful place because you feel that it's a place of passion um, and there is room for passion as well. Um, this is in Oxford again. I, d I don't live in Oxford, but the Pitt Rivers um, is this most wonderful cabinet of curiosities. You know, they are interpreted, but you can't read the writing on the labels. Um, and they're gathered. They're gathered, gathered in very obscure typologies uh, and again, it doesn't really matter um, because it's an experience, an, an, an event, and, and it's not something necessarily we should replace. I, I think there's room for this and for those that want to make the pilgrimage to such institutions. Um, now, this is a modern version. Now, this is interesting. This is at uh, Duxford Imperial War Museum. This is interesting because in a modern setting, the the curator can't let go, you know, it's like a jigsaw, they've been jigsawed in together um, and uh, the aesthetics are ignored, you know, the beauty of these objects is ignored to get them all in and fit them in because they exist and, and there may be a reason that they need to be protected, um, so shove them in the shed but then there should be another shed for that and this shed should be for you enjoying the objects and understanding the context of the objects. This is um, um, unashamedly a, a holiday photo, but you know that, that works so well. This 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 was a, this was about passion, and these were you know look at that beautiful object that you know really proudly presented with the men that flew it and knew about it being the interpreters. And and I just raise this because I just remember what a wonderful experience it was for us all, and and how valuable it is to have and remember face-to-face uh, -face communication. Also, you know, they're called docents in, in the States. I never quite know what that word means, but it, uh, it, it was memorable and, it, and it, it will live with me forever because of the, the quality of the interpretation and the storytelling. Um, the Natural History Museum, I'm just trying to track back to where it all started. And they, uh, Roger Miles wrote this book, which was the kind of systematic way of creating guidelines for, you know, in 1965, I think, the first um, advent of museum, in-house in museum designers at the Natural History Museum. And this was, uh, Roger Miles was a very important person, but it was a way of trying to give a kind of s understand how people moved and dwell times and movement systems, not so much about narratives, but it was beginning to give a science and a shape to the business that we're in. And I don't know why I show this image, because it is extraordinary. This was 1997, um, when the Natural History Museum, would you believe, kind of went Disney. Um, and this is still here as an entrance uh, to the Earth Galleries. 
quite extraordinary and, and it, it takes your breath away and maybe that's the expression, I'm not sure, but it, it's, it's incredible how the impact that that's, uh, that's had on museum making. Um, as an architect, I have really, th th this, this is really close to my heart, the, the whole sense of um, how architects and town, and, and town master planning has impacted. You know, I have to really look at this holistic picture. I'm, I, I apologize, this is about exhibitions. But Museum Insel in Berlin, you know, the, the fact that museums can actually create cultural space and have gravitas on a master planning scale and the rebuilding of the Museum Insel, the wonderful Neues Museum, the David Chipperfield and Julian Harrop, which I don't talk about now, but extraordinary piece of, of knitting of an old building and, and new installations. And even regionally, you know, your wonderful Louisiana says it all really. Um, you know, this is a very small town in Cornwall with a maritime museum. It, we're actually in it now, you can't see it, but it, the end of a high street, a tiny town trying to impact on the dynamic of, uh, of the kind of um, uh, tourist tourism strategy. You know, it's, it's fantastic that it, it can do that. And now, this is where I get a bit vicious about architects. And um, I think that um, Faino, uh, Zaha did is very, uh, as you probably know, it, it, it's not site specific. She does what she does. And it's a, this is a beautiful piece of sculpting. Without a shadow of a doubt, it's a science center in Wolfsburg. And it, it is beautiful as an object. But I asked the question, um, is that what should be going inside? And where is the program of events? And who really understands whether you collect all these objects from the Exploratorium in San Francisco and just dump them on the floor in a, 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 in a shed that's not very well finished? Beautiful on the outside, doesn't work on the inside at all. I mean, you can start to pick this apart. It's a very random uh, sort of jumble sale of objects. And somebody somewhere has to be responsible for that. And I think Zaha has to accept some responsibilities. This is Frank Geary, this is the Experience Music Project, which is quite a kind of didactic journey through the um, history of popular music in Seattle. And, you know, the typical Geary kind of folded metal exterior. And that's the entrance space on the interior, which has, of course, uh, been forgotten. But Geary, remember, was important to us all for the Guggenheim effect. But one wonders at what cost. The Guggenheim clearly has a slightly uh, a better quality and understanding of the interior than this does. But that's what the curators and museum designers have been left with there. Celia Island in the UAE, um, this extraordinary, um, actually commissioned by the Tourist Authority. Uh, it's, it's all about cultural tourism. We've got a, a Guggenheim, we've got a Louvre, we've got a Maritime Museum and a couple of other museums, five museums uh, on an island. So you can do culture in a weekend. Um, you know, it's just, that's the way it's kind of working now. So I think that um, we have to take a view on the impact of, um, we have to take a view on the impact of, of the Middle East and, and China and, and just ask ourselves, where's it all going? Because we, uh, you know, we're, uh, you know, experts of being commissioned mostly from Europe or the States to come and, and try and help develop these iconic structures. But they have no program. The interiors have no program. They're usually vanity projects. They have a very kind of threadbare stories to tell. And they are costing a fortune and making a, a mark, an impact on the world in a very peculiar way. Um, and in Dakran, where this, you know, 90,000 people in Dakran, and we know about the, the lack of kind of liberal attitudes to movement in the country. And uh, my question really is, um, as practitioners, we should be asking the question of um, what's happening out there where there's profligate uh, money to spend on our culture. So this was a revelation for me when I came to talk here because I started to look at things that I really liked as architectural objects, as total exhibits. And if there are any um, architects here, they'll know about Carlo Scarpa, who was, for me, a revelation as a student. And when I went to Castelvecchio, I was stunned. It, it is an amazing piece of, it's an architectural masterclass where the, the objects are not really interpreted, but they're woven in a sculptural way through the whole uh, period structure, uh, just beautifully, um, sensitively. And at the time, I didn't really understand this business, and I, I, it, it didn't really matter to me because of just the power of, of actually being there. Um, and this was another revelation, was um, 
the Natural History Museum in Paris. It's very funny, I, I kind of going to describe it as a Victorian structure. How dare I call it a Victorian structure? It's French, you know. But it's a beautiful, um, lightweight, you know, steel structure that has cast iron, probably. Um, that's actually been reworked by, by the architects, um, essentially, who've, who've really uh, understood the space and have created this wonderful kind of Noah's Ark running through it. And um, I think that, uh, and all the floors are kind of cutaways, you know, we go from birds to fish as, 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 as the terrain, terrarium is cut through on the floors. And the changing light displays from night to day of Noah's Ark, you know, total scenography, total theater. And the stories are told level by level within this period existing structure. And then, you know, in terms of narrative and dealing with complex subject matter, this, uh, the Holocaust Museum in Washington, um, we're exhibition designer and architect. You know, the narrative, the symbolism of the architecture is just gripping. You know, the, the, the subject matter has been understood fully by um, the architect, Owen Pei. And, and the journey through it is just linked and locked in to the symbolism embedded within the architecture. Um, the narrative has been adopted by, by the architect. And isn't it, there aren't many museums where you cry, <laughs> and I remember crying there, and, and, and following journeys of people through the little passports. So um, quite extraordinary. And, um, and then, and then that, that gallery, which is, represents photographs of a village that was annihilated by, by the Nazis. Um, and you walk through the space, you walk through the village. And back at the Ashmolean, where now they've reassembled the objects, it's about crossing culture, crossing time. They've actually broken the objects down into um, how ideas and, 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 and materials and cultures cr cross the world, really. So they've been assembled in a very different way. The star objects are, are not the rarest or the most valuable. They're now things that relate to merchants or, or soldiers or um, um, pilgrims, you know. So it's just a very brave kind of uh, move, if, if you like. So this is a tiny case study just about the, the kind of inside out process, the Mary Rose Museum that we worked on in, um, in Portsmouth. And um, this was a seven year collaboration with architects, engineers, conservations, conservationist curators, and many of the people in the client team had actually dived on the original um, Mary Rose which was, um, it actually sank in 1545, it was lifted in 1982. This is our Vasa, except it sailed for 33 years. Um, and um, it's a snapshot of Tudor, Tudor history because as the hull broke away in two, um, they captured, the, this half was covered in silt, and they captured all the objects and, and, and took the objects that were beautifully conserved because they've been under, under the sand and they've displayed them, and so we represent them as a snapshot of British Tudor history. It actually sank in front of um, Henry VIII. I mean, it gets better, doesn't it? Um, it's interesting because it's in, a, it's in a dry dock. It's actually in a dry dock where it's settled, and it's still being uh, dried out um, very, very slowly, not quite finished yet. But um, the, uh, the idea here was very much to look at the two halves and say one half um, will sit there, we can't do much about it except conserve it, and we'll reflect the other half. So the, the organizing principle is the objects will be I embedded in the new half, and the hull, which can't take any objects, would be on, in the other half. It's a bit like Damien Hirst's shark, that you cow that you walk between. And this would have a lid. Um, and then uh, all the stories could be told in, in that way, shown in that section there. The, the, the stories floor by floor, deck by deck, we're on it, yeah. Deck by deck could be told in the reflected uh, hull. So a movement system was very important. We had to push the interpretation stories to the ends, um, and we had to understand how you go from main deck to lower deck to upper deck, which is quite complicated. But just knitting all of this kind of systematic movement through the building, understanding the, the central narr narrative, which is to tell the stories through the context gallery. That's the context gallery with no labels at all. Everything's set in place. Uh, the stories are told at the end galleries. And, um, and we use some... Um, some some limited audio-visual devices. But the end galleries are quite interesting because they uh, actually 
represent um, character cases. So we've taken characters and each of those characters has a case dedicated to themselves. So through the ship we take characters deck by deck because there was a kind of hierarchy from lower deck to upper deck. Officers, gunners, uh, cooks and, and um, store, storekeepers down below. And I've spoken to the director about this. I, I just posed the question, what do you think that review said about your brand new museum, Maritime Museum, which is actually set in a, in a dry dock, which is interesting. We can talk about that later, but I have permission from the director. Commercial pressures. Well, um, I have to say that the that museums now have to be incredibly financially accountable. You all know about that, but they never used to be. Uh, there are business plans. Uh, it's not just directors, boards, and, 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 and um, uh, curators now. It's, it's much more important. This photograph I took at the Louvre kind of captured it, really, you know, shopping and, and learning, as I call it. At the V&A, um, when we worked on Couture, we had to understand the marketing strategies. We knew about the book being written. We knew about the, uh, the quality of the merchandise. That was introduced to us. We knew about the poster. We knew about everything peripheral, apparently, to what we, what we do as designers. So there's a kind of relationship between the exhibition and the merchandise, strangely. It's kind of our responsibility. And also, um, what's interesting with uh, this, this, this whole kind of growth of the temporary and the permanent, is the pressure to make, and this was Donabers at the Natural History Museum, the first exhibition after the museum was made free entry. So we had to try and make it look permanent because people were paying, after coming through the door for nothing of a national museum, you're asking them to pay to come into a tiny, or not that big, a temporary gallery. So the pressures of a, of a designer to make temporary look permanent and also to make it flat pack because it's off touring. So that was a challenge in terms of what, what we do for a living, really. And the temporary space just generally um, has become very important to our national galleries because this is because of free access. They have to make their money with events, shops, um, cafes and temporary exhibitions. So the temporary space, many of our museums are building temporary spaces. The Vikings has just opened in the new temporary space at the British Museum. Um, and so just to understand the dynamic of that and how we as designers or, or we as, as bodies are accepting the need for temporary galleries and what is the critical mass, how big are they, how good are they, how long do people spend in them, and how much do we spend on making them, and do we try and make them touring to make money. And then, of course, there's the blockbuster. Uh, this is Bowie. Um, did I have to say that? It's pretty self-evident, isn't it? But um, I think that uh, um, the questions have to be asked now. That, that What is the driver, as I started the talk with, what is the, the driver about um, celebrating popular culture relentlessly, one after the other? Roy Strong, who used to be director of the V&A, has challenged this obsession with big blockbusters because stories need to be told that aren't necessarily blockbusters, that aren't going to make the revenue, but are very valuable in helping us understand our material culture. And I know the whole relationship with permanent galleries is to be debated later on. So this is another kind of mini um, um, case study Pompeii and Herculaneum, which was a blockbuster at the British Museum that we designed. This is the old space, the reading room. Um, and just to say that, you know, we, of course we work with a big team. We all know about working with big teams. But again, we had a lot of pressure on us. The, the, the curator had devised a narrative, an organizing principle, which was very powerful, which was about the objects of the story told in the context of the space. So we built a Roman villa. So all of the objects were located in context of that villa. But our involvement and understanding of every single object, every single object that, that was to be loaned from Naples or from the museum itself was absolutely critical. It's just extraordinary how embedded we are in that process now. So the first thing we have to do is we have to really understand the um, we have to stand, understand a plan, and we have to understand how 480,000 people in six months are going to pass through that plan. 
What is the dwell time? You know, where are the objects related to in, in relation to one another? We have to interrogate every square meter to understand how people are going to move through that space because the impact on the blockbuster design is just phenomenal in terms of, its, uh, in terms of the requirements of a designer uh, understanding movement systems. So, you know, uh, you know, traffic engineering, if you like. Um, and then I just put this in to remind me of my journey to see the director down the corridor to have it signed off. You know, it's signed off at that level, and if he doesn't like it, you go back to the drawing board. I, I made this out of cardboard, actually, um, and everybody was very worried because it looked like it was made out of cardboard. But for me, it was a working, working model. And just a couple of shots of the, of the uh, exhibition. Um, that's the atrium, of course. So with the kind of Rothko walls, the walls were kind of graded out to be slightly Rothko, uh, using different colors in different spaces. Um, it's interesting, Rothko, I found later, was actually influenced by Pompeii. So I felt pretty good about that and post-rationalized it to death. Um, and you know, just the tools we have to use now to try and uh, understand the ideas and sell the ideas. Remember, this is for Goldman Sachs, actually. They're, they're, they're sponsoring this exhibition, and boy, do they get a lot out of it. They come and bring their clients back in the evenings. You know, they have drinks, par uh, drinks receptions right through the whole duration. It's big business now, and those big partners are important. This is important to us as well. We hold our breaths as the, we open the newspapers to read the reviews because, you know, we live or die on the strength of the reviews, and we got lucky on this one. But they're, you know, we all know that they're, their marketing is phenomenal. You know, we, we get on prime time television, 10 o'clock news on the BBC, the opening of five minutes, the opening of Pompeii. It's really big business. And this one is, is actually, it was transmitted to cinemas, a thousand cinemas, uh, a live transmission. So my question here is, are we, um, actually, are we designing our, our, our exhibitions now to be made into television? Because that's very different, and, and because I've worked in television. And to a certain extent, I did. I made some design decisions which related to um, that medium, if you like. So um, the 10-year diagram, which I was miming, um, and I won't dwell on this, but it's interesting. It, for me, uh, it's about narrative it's about architecture space, it's about story, and it's about communication media. And it really did take me 10 years to draw that diagram. And it's very important because I think it demonstrates the complexity of what we do. And if there are designers here, I'm sure they'll confirm with that, confer with that. Um, because, you know, actually in this presentation, there are something like 24 different design practitioners and, and, and architects. And, and this you know, this conference is, is a representation of this growing discipline. There are fantastic quality designers uh, out there now, uh, everywhere. There are courses, I'm involved with a course at Central St. Martins called Narrative Environments, and we have a conference called Chaos in the Museum in April. It's fantastic. Books are being written. Vanity books, Cosman de Jong have written fantastic vanity books. It doesn't matter. People are actually talking and debating about this new discipline. So it's, it's emerging, it's new, it, it's valued. And, um, and you're sustaining it, and, and we're, 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 we, you know, we're reflecting on that and trying to respond to that. And we are like the film industry. This is, this is a shot of um, a, uh, just a, a review, of, uh, an evaluation process of, um, uh, that, that we carried out. There were writers there. there, there there's writer from Rolling, this is British Music Experience, Rolling Stone magazine, Word magazine, there's a director, there are researchers, graphic designers, software, hardware. This is the film industry now. We're just leaning on everybody we can to make things happen. Emerging talents, we're using, you know, uh, UVA light artists. Um, Big media, you know, we're working scenographically with filmmakers. Um, people that do things in the movies at Pinewood Studios are now working in museums. Um, graphic communications, which I've, we must never take for granted. This is a fantastic tradition of, of graphics now, and, and we really have to respect it and understand it. The whole starting point um, way back in the 30s of exhibition design was to do with information and diagrams and actually imparting that information with very simple graphic information. So it's something that we need to actually still hold on to and respect. And then digital media, this...
And then futures, and I'll just check how long I've got. Um, just about enough. Futures is um, very important, and this is incredibly random, but I, I'll, just, I'll just lay these ideas down. The Distributed Museum, inspired by uh, Venice Biennale, is this time that we don't have the big pieces of real estate in our cities, uh, that we actually have these hubs and we distribute to satellites uh, in, the, you know, in the suburbs, spread around. So the experience of the, um, of the museum is a promenade experience. There's lots of arguments for that, instead of this big icon in the middle of a city. Um, Venice Biennale, and, and of course, you know, shopping and learning, you know, how do we deal with this? How do we understand the dynamic of casinos or um, airports or hotels actually hosting um, objects and stories that need to be told? Augmentation is a big word, um, which, uh, you know, I, I, I just see it really having a lot to do with what we call um, unlocking the glass case, where we can actually get into objects, unlock them and augment them, and we can augment them in language, we can augment them at different layers of uh, intellectual engagement. So this, this digital world allows us many things, many opportunities to engage with, you know, what I call the power of the real. The appropriate use of media, you know, a, a science museum uses 40 touch screens in 2009, and by 2011, that, that show is, is on a TED talk with Mike Natas having all of that show on an iPad. You know, it's really hard to keep chasing uh, the emerging media and understanding the appropriate use of media. Um, this is just the final couple of slides about the power of the real. Um, it's the, it's to, to me, and we were, I was talking earlier to Bernadette and, and to Alex about this, that it's really important to all of us, the importance of, um, of the real. This actually is very interesting. This is at Chatham Dockyard. I keep coming back to the maritime stories, but th this was where the, the lines of victory were laid down on, on the very floor in the dockyard, where they used to have to build the outline um, on, in, r in real size. They would chalk it out, and then they would make templates. They would make a former, and then they would take it to the dock, and they would build the vessel, and then they would do the next section. So they would just carry on building the sections um, that they would then build the ship from. This was the floor where these ships, 170 warships, which created the British Navy, which ruled the world, which took the colonies because of the ships that were built here in this dockyard. The real thing in here is the floor, actually. And all we're doing is augmenting it with media. So the media unfolds, we tell the story, full size, on the floor. The floor is the real thing, which is quite fascinating, really. Uh, and then the power of my reel, and this is just an added slide, um, again, as we, as we talked earlier. Um, and this is really just opening a debate that will continue, and that's, that's about the museum experience really be, being democratized and being open to ourselves and our collections. We shouldn't rely on the museum having a storehouse of, sto of objects that tell the stories of our lives. We, we have that storehouse as well. This is uh, LZ74 that was, I found out was, um, my grandfather was in the, in the um, it flew Zeppelins, my mother's German, and he flew Zeppelins in the First World War. And I'd seen this in my cousin's uh, study and, and said, T send me a photograph. It had LZ74 on it, and with one hour, uh, with one, one hour, we through Google and going to the public records office in London. I found that they'd flown to Sunderland, they'd, they'd bombed an armaments factory and it had been shot down. He wasn't on board then, it had been shot down coming back over Norfolk. It's just the most remarkable story told through that object of my life, my history. Um, nobody's got that story. Uh, it doesn't exist. I think it's pretty fascinating and, and there are many more stories out there um, that we need to be telling by valuing um, by valuing ourselves and by using the, the, the you know, the, the very place of museum and using the expertise and skills of museums and inviting um, participation uh, from the public who can bring uh, their own stories. That's it. Thank you.